Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our external consulting webinar series. My name is Tony Chiak, and I serve as the unit head within management engineering and consulting. During this webinar, we'll discuss Mayo Clinic's facility planning program. This program serves to transform Mayo Clinic's practice for providing the highest quality care to its patients, and we'll discuss how the committee engages in initiation, planning, and oversight of major facility and construction projects. First, I'd like to share information about Mayo Clinic and our department, Management Engineering and Consulting. Here is some information on the Mayo Clinic Enterprise. In Rochester, we see 400,000 patients per year with 2,380 physicians and scientists, including 125 primary care providers. In the community and regional health system, we have it set up in four regions with 18 hospitals, and we are in 75 communities in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. The Mayo Clinic Health System sees approximately 525,000 patients per year with 1,140 physicians. At the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, we see approximately 115,000 patients per year with 621 physicians and scientists. The Mayo Clinic in Florida, we see about 110,000 patients per year with 559 physicians and scientists. Here's some background on the Management Engineering and Consulting Department at Mayo Clinic. MENC was founded in 1947 and have engaged in healthcare consulting business for over 70 years. Our mission is to partner with clients to achieve the best patient experience through objective, innovative, and integrative business consulting. And our key capability is end-to-end -end internal and external consulting across practice, research, education, and administration within an enterprise setting. And here are a few details about our staff in management engineering and consulting. We have 200 team members made up of health systems engineers, project managers, and support staff. We pride ourselves in attracting and retaining a very diverse workforce. We've been able to attract diversified and talented staff that have lived and worked in 36 different countries. We also have a very multidisciplinary educational backgrounds and experience, such as business administration, nursing, organizational leadership, engineering, finance, and public health, and others. And here are five service lines. The first one is management systems and process engineering, where we apply a variety of engineering tools to improve business performance, such as Lean Six Sigma, advanced analytics, simulation modeling, and optimization. We help integrate multiple disciplines to study and solve complex problems using a systems approach. The next one is strategy design and execution. This is where we help develop and refine business objectives, define key business measurements, and accelerate design and development of key strategic initiatives. The next is change management and organizational transformation. This involves vis vision, design, and development, change management planning, and implementation of best practices. The next is revenue enhancement and expense management, where we work on business process redesign to decrease operational expenses, improve supply chain efficiency, and identify new revenue opportunities. The final is project management, where we utilize a structured and disciplined methodology project framework to deliver improvement plans to complex projects. Here are a few examples of some projects that we have worked on in MENC. We've worked on a comprehensive outpatient and rehabilita rehabilitation care clinic pilot. We've done master planning and cardiovascular diseases, cardiovascular surgery, hematology, and many other ones. We've also developed innovative clinic space utilization assessments. We worked in the OR room build out renovation, recent, recent uh, with two facilities in Arizona and uh, Rochester with the Proton Beam facility. Uh, we've worked with the Mayo Clinic Florida Hospital Master Planning and two major projects in Arizona, the PCAP project and the Arizona Forward project. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Our first guest speaker is Dr. Therese Horlocker, who is a professor of anesthesiology and orthopedics. She has authored or co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed articles. Dr. Horlocker is past president of the American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine and previously chaired the FDA Advisory Committee on Anesthetic and Life Support Drugs, as well as the section on regional anesthesia in the Journal of Anesthesia and Analgesia. She is current chair of Midwest Facilities Committee. 
Our next speaker is Danielle Crawley. Danielle is a health systems engineer in the Department of Management, Engineering, and Consulting in Mayo Clinic Rochester. She is part of a team of providing business consulting to help the clinical practice discover, initiate, plan, and execute new ways to help patients and staff. Danielle has a Bachelor's of Healthcare Administration from Montana State University and a Master's of Health and Human Services Administration from St. Mary's University, Minnesota. She has over 12 years of healthcare experience with six being in mental health. Danielle has partnered with the hospital leadership team and facilities to help them optimize space to meet the practice needs, which includes creating a new specialized patient care unit. She has also provided support coordinating unit moves in the hospital as facilities are updated and new buildings are built. Danielle really enjoys working on projects that are complex, multifaceted, and have many pieces to put together to develop an operational solution. Now I would like to talk with Dr. Horlocker and ask her a few questions. Welcome, Dr. Horlocker. Thank you. Um, so there's some big news this past week about a major facilities project in Rochester on the Gonda building. Can you give us some insights on what this will entail? Sure, I'd be happy to do so. So because of the ongoing space crunch here in Rochester, Mayo has formed a strategic collaboration with the Pontiac Land Group to expand the Gonda building by 11 floors. Mm -hmm. That third phase has always been planned. The first four floors will be clinically oriented and there will be two floors of that that are going to be a procedural center and one floor de dedicated to cancer care and the other one has really been unassigned at this point. The 11 remaining floors are going to be a premier level hotel which is really exciting because the um, Pontiac Land Group which is owned by the Cui family is not just a developer of space they are also Mayo Clinic patients and they want to be part of the Mayo Clinic experience and the journey with the patients. So they want to develop this hotel so that it makes a seamless experience for patients and in fact we might even be able to extend some of our care to our patients there, not as a hospital setting but just to allow them to rehabilitate. So it's, it's really wow. an exciting time. It's great. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you get involved in the facilities committee? Well, you may not know this, but underneath the veneer of this anesthesiologist lies the heart of an engineer. I have an undergrad degree in chemical engineering. Oh. So um, working as an anesthesiologist with all my engineering training, I am living the dream. <laughs> Good for you. So as a full-time anesthesiologist, how have you made time to serve on the committee? Well, thankfully, the institution values my responsibility, and so they provide me with a day and a half a week so I'm able to fulfill, fulfill my responsibilities. Well, that's great. Can you give our audience a brief overview of the Mayo Clinic Midwest Facilities Committee and its function? Sure. So the Midwest Facilities Committee oversees all projects that are greater than $5 million in major capital. We also oversee any new space, whether it's created as an addition to existing space or a new building. So that's kind of how, how what we're involved in. We also arbitrate between the space shields as in administration, research, education, and clinical space because we have those four different space groups in Rochester. Now how is it structured? Well, it's a, it's a role-based membership, so we have membership from all of those shields, and we also have um, me um, membership from finance, from nursing, and, um, and the facilities um, project managers also. So that's the membership of that, which rotates um, accordingly because we don't want to really have anybody on there for too long, including myself. <laughs> My role it will be, is there for about seven years, and that's good because I, if you notice, um, the, at Mayo Clinic, most of the chairs of committees are physicians because we're in the practice. And you want to know what the practice is to be able to build and evolve the practice. So the, the um, membership rotates off and on. How much do we get to deal with every year? Our operating budget is probably around $230 million. Wow, that's yep. significant. Yep. Mm. And I still wear jeans from Kohl's. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, that is interesting. Do now, do all the members, physician members, get protected time to be on no, the committee? No, they the don't. Chair. And so often when we're trying to assign a liaison to a steering committee or to one of these major capital projects, it'll be either me or Dr. Frank who chairs the Midwest space that'll take that role because because it is time consuming. Okay. So how has the Mayo Clinic Midwest Facility Committee evolved over time? That's a really good question because the Midwest Facilities Co um, Committee did not exist until January of 2017. Before that, there was 
the Mayo Clinic um, Rochester facilities and the, um, the healthcare system in the Midwest facilities. And so we merged them for the first time in 2017. The reason for that is just so that both groups could get to know the respective practices better, as well as show transparency in how we assess projects and pay for them. So we weren't saying too much is going to the health system, and the health system has been saying too much is going to Rochester. So the health system for, um, had to really meld themselves, too. As you had mentioned, there's four regions, and they all kind of functioned independently. So they had to come together, and then they had to join with us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why our, our Midwest facilities has membership from both the health system as well as Rochester. Okay. And how about at an enterprise level? Yeah. Is that so there's not an enterprise group yet. I assume that there probably will be in the future because I often get questions about Arizona and Florida, and I really don't know anything about those projects. But it really does help, again, for the transparency and the distribution of, of funds so that we really are able to prioritize across the different um, satellites and, and hospitals. And if you don't really have a good idea of all of those, it's hard to prioritize. Sure. Okay. Um, for facilities projects underway, remodel or new construction, what role does the committee have in the oversight of those projects? So for the bigger, for the bigger projects, what we do is assign a liaison that, that is the person that kind of interfaces between the Midwest Facilities Committee and the project. And that person's role is to really keep things on track because many times the proponents of these, of these large uh, projects especially have not had this kind of an experience before. So it's easy to run amok and change the scope. Mm -hmm. um, we want to stay on timeline. We want to stay on budget. So that's the, that's the role of what the, the liaison does. Also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, everybody always sits down at the table with good intentions, but, but there can be tensions between different groups. And so the liaison will bring those issues back to the Midwest facilities to, um, to arbitrate. Okay. And then um, finally, that person will be the one that or the um, that at the end of the at the end of the project when it's finally going to be approved will bring that back to Midwest facilities and kind of shepherd it through and do the presentation and make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Okay, great. Um, can you talk about the relationship with our management engineering and consulting department and the value they bring to facilities project? I would love to. I tell you, when I first met MENC, that was one of the best days of my life because everybody knows I, my first thing is better living through mathematics. Well, actually, it's maybe better living through pharmacology when I'm in the OR. But, <laughs> but MENC is just integral to us being able to build things correctly because often proponents already have a solution in mind. And, they, and it often involves more space when they're just not actually using their space correctly. Mm -hmm. So with MENC, they will go and do utilization. They'll, they'll determine how big things have to be, how many things have to be there, workflow. And so we can really get by with fewer resources because of, of MEIC. Great. Um, are there guiding principles or philosophies used when deliberating on facilities projects? And how much are these directed by the institution versus by the committee? Well, the first guiding principle, which people don't ever want to hear, is that all space is owned by Mayo Clinic leadership and is allocated as such. So it's not my operating room or my office. It's actually Mayo Clinic leadership owns, owns that. And so if we can get people to understand it, then they don't think so bad when we're reallocating it because they don't look at it as being taken away as much. They, mm -hmm. they still um, don't really like that. But that's one of the things that we really have to uh, get people to know. We had to actually reassign some offices on one floor to, so that they could be shared offices for another group of folks. The ones we took them away from said, no, 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 we've got a 50% utilization, but they had so many exam rooms that they were able to take half of them offline and have them as private offices and never see a patient in them. Oh. So they didn't, they didn't really like that. That was the first land grab that we had to do um, when I was a space chair, and it's gotten a little bit better since then, but, but just that concept that space is really owned by the, by the Mayo Clinic leadership and can be reallocated. So some of the other principles and philosophies that we do, and we're kind of thinking about how we're going to allocate space or expand space, is whether this request follows the institutional strategic growth plan and the oper operational priorities. You know, we have that um, competitive growth um, plan that we have. So if, if you're in transplant or cancer care, um, spine, those are the things we, we really want to push at this point in time. 
Of course, this is a Mayo Clinic, so we always say the needs of the patient come first. Mm -hmm. And so if it comes down to do we need four more exam rooms or four more offices, we're going to give you the exam rooms, mm -hmm. and, and then we'll just deal with the office offices later. Cost benefits got to always um, you know, be included also in there. We um, also have to take into account safety for both our patients and our staff, and Danielle will talk about that later. But one of the other things we've done for that, for example, is now it's just a... Um, a requirement to put patient lifts in when we remodel rooms and that has really decreased the number of, of um, injuries to our staff. Now we talk about user, user satisfaction also. Sometimes it's user dissatisfaction when it comes to offices and I've been involved in the group that came up with the new office standards where we're making fewer people with private offices and those that have them are smaller but mm -hmm. I take it as my role that I should have everybody equally mad at me and then I know that I've, I've done it correctly. Good for you. <laughs> We also have a, um, green energy that we consider, and we do have an office of sustainability, but just to show you, when we started looking at the, the energy, energy utilization index, in 2010, we had hoped to cut our energy by 20%. We did it in seven and a half years, wow, just by these. Great. So we, we do implement these things as we can, knowing that it's going to be um, kind of a risk benefit, because getting that last 5%, you're gonna spend a lot of dollars. So at some point we say, we can't go 100% green just because we've got old buildings, but certainly when we build new things, we take that into account. And then um, finally, we do benchmark with other institutions. Sometimes we find that there's a facilities gap, so to speak. Sometimes that it's not necessarily you want to fill. And as an example, that when we re uh, modeled the birth center, we had to put one of those hot tubs for for in water deliveries. And we're like, you know, this is going to just be good for staff at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what's happened. It doesn't get used as much. But again, for an advertising thing, we we had to look at the facilities elsewhere and and build accordingly. Okay, great. So for a typical facilities project, who are the major stakeholders, internal and external? And generally speaking, what value are they bringing to the project? Well, first you have the proponents, and they represent the practice. They know the practice better than I can know the practice. And they, they bring that expertise to this. It's very important, though, um, and, and Danielle knows this, that you don't always accept the status quo, that just because we've always done it this way, we need to do it that way. Because as I mentioned earlier, often the stakeholders will come in and they already have a solution and we haven't really even defined what the true project um, is at that point in time. So that's why my second um, group of people that I think are the most important are M, E, and C because they help actually quantify the project. They, they tell us what, what we really need to do. And they also help too because as I said, the better living through mathematics, you know, numbers, as long as you have good data, mm -hmm. don't, don't lie. And so as long as you have good data, you can make informed decisions. And that's really important because all of us remember our worst days when I got home late because uh, we couldn't get the ORs done. But we don't remember the day we finish things early. Mm -hmm. And a good example of that is we tend to um, place all of our patients in the exam rooms that are closest to the desk. And so they look at all the congestion by the desk there and mm -hmm. think, look at, look at what kind of it is. But if you walked all the way down to the end of the hall, it's a ghost town. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just bringing ME and C in really, um, really helps. Um, then we have our other folks in the facilities department that keep everything on track and consistent from the um, Mayo standpoint. So they've done projects around around the other buildings. We have a, a division um, for both inpatient and then a separate one for outpatient because those facilities are so different. Mm -hmm. So they help make, make sure that we, we stay on track and also bring the expertise of how projects have gone before. Because as I mentioned, even with some of the smaller projects, many times proponents have not had the opportunity to do this and they, they do get confused and they don't really even know how to approach it. Then that com, um, comes up to the facilities committee where it's our job to oversee th the project so that we continue with the strategic policies of Mayo so we stay on target because we have a bigger view and um, the Midwest Executive Operations Team to whom Midwest Facilities Exec, exec reports, um, we are the ones that know or we don't always know what they what they know so they tell us so we make sure that we stay on track with what they tell us so it's kind okay. of a, a trickle-down effect from mm -hmm. that standpoint 
We also have external contractors, which will bring in an yeah. outside view. So that's also very helpful because I, I was born in Rochester, and you know I grew up saying there's three ways of doing things, the right way, the wrong way, and the male way. And sometimes we've done things the same way for so long, it's nice mm -hmm. to have that fresh set of eyes on yeah. us also. And then there's, of course, the finance folks, and you know they print money. So we, whatever we need to do to <laughs> get the money, that, that's Good. pretty much it. But I want to just give you a, a, a good example of that. So about three or four years ago, our preoperative evaluation clinic did some calculations, and they thought that they were going to be able to expand from 10,000 to 18,000 patients over five years. And, and because of that, they thought it's a 30% increase, they thought that they were going to need 30% more staff and 30% more space. They just mm -hmm. purely assumed that. So they got the OCG people to to um, uh, approve the, the folks, but then MUNC got involved, and they did these calculations, and they said, hey, if you just load level and don't, don't um, do what I call the camel hump where you kind of gear up from the morning mm -hmm. and then come down from lunch and then nothing happens for an hour and then you gear up again yeah, and you got all nice full bellies so nobody really wants to work. And, and that, mm -hmm. But that camel hump, there's an incredible amount of momentum that's lost. So they said, if you bring your respiratory therapists and they're the ones that do the intake, if you bring them in for 10 hour shifts and have them work through the noon hour, mm -hmm. we basically did not need any more space and the whole project cost $120,000. Yeah. And we were still able to meet those goals. That's but great. we couldn't have done that without MUNC. Yeah, there's another example where um, one of our staff did a scheduling optimization in the chemotherapy unit where it was yeah. the same thing where they thought they were at capacity at those peak times and through yeah. that scheduling optimization, they found that they could grow, yeah. you know, for another three years yeah. before they needed space. So yeah, and those three years are up, and now they're talking to me again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, what are some of the challenges you foresee related to facilities for Mayo Clinic and healthcare providers in general? That's a really good question because the true challenge is we don't know where healthcare is going to be in ten or twenty years. I, I've been on staff for twenty nine years, and if you would have asked me, we'd be doing hips as outpatients. Um, now, when it used to be a 10 to 14 day admission, mm -hmm. I'd say you're, you're, you'd be crazy. So mm -hmm. what we have to do is somehow anticipate where we're going to be in 10 or 20 years and build facilities accordingly or build them flexible enough so that we can change, change them over to, to whatever they will be. So we do try to make all the procedural rooms the same size. So we can do either an open procedure, you know, like a, well, actually most of, even our abdominal stuff is not as open as they used to be, but you could do a minimally evasive, a robotic, um, any of those kinds of things. I suspect we're gonna have, our hospitals will be more ICU type patients or procedural space. And you can see the real, the real challenge is gonna be how do we, how do we reconvert the rest of it, what we've already built, so it's still usable mm -hmm. and, and keep it relevant? Yeah, so one of the projects we're working on is looking at uh, inpatient procedures that could be done in the outpatient right. setting. And I think some of the challenge we may face is how do we find space and convert right. space, you know, out yes. of the hospital. Um, so, yeah, interesting. I think there's also going to be some issues with, with monitoring patients at home because we mm -hmm. are our length of stay has gone way down and we are sending patients out sooner. But that doesn't mean they're healthier. I mean, we know we've got an aging population and they're getting more um, comorbidities because they're living longer. And so we have to figure out how we're going to do that. And our facilities of the future mm -hmm. may be some kind of an extension of our hospital into the patient's home. So from an engineering standpoint, of course, I love that, but, yeah. but I don't know how it's going to work out. Yeah, it's almost interesting. It may be a central command center yeah. where we're monitoring, you know, all yeah. the patients at home right. and remotely in different states. Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot of changes coming. So what are lessons learned as a committee leader that you're able to share with other facility leaders? Well, I've only been chair of this Midwest facilities two years, so that's kind of fun. It's been learning the, the growing pains for that, so I'll kind of meld in what I learned from being um, chair of space and remodeling. I think the biggest thing is is to listen, because mm -hmm. I don't know all the practice. Now, as an anesthesiologist and having been here for so long, you know, we've got our tentacles into a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, OB and, and um, ICU and the, the pediatric intensive care unit and pain and the ORs and the procedural center, so we know a lot of it. But I don't know everything. And, mm -hmm. and so I really rely on, on the clinicians to, to help guide us. So, so listen is my first thing. Number two is get ME and C involved early <laughs> on because you have to manage expectations. So often the proponents think that they're doing themselves a favor by trying to do the work 
ahead of time, mm -hmm. and then we're having to rein them back in and change the scope. And, they, and they're looking at it as we took this away from them instead of it should have never even gotten that far. So that's one of those things, the true better living through mathematics. Um, mm -hmm. Get them involved very early. Surround yourself um, with, with a good team yeah. so, so you don't have to know everything. Mm -hmm. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you have everybody equally mad at you because then you know you're doing your job well. Good, good, good. <laughs> So what are the key elements of a successful facilities project? Well, that's kind of the same, the same answer that I give to the previous question. Uh, plan early, bring, bring the, the needs to the, whichever um, reporting committee it is early on so that they know of this projected need and that they can answer it. And so we're not, we're not trying to play catch up or, and we're not on a strict timeline. That always makes it harder because um, Chuck Olson, my, my mentor, said you know, the, the line that facilities does not drive the practice, the practice drives facilities. Horlocker's corollary to that is if you do something fast, you either do it stupid or expensive or both. Mm -hmm. and, and there are some, ex, uh, you know, I can tell you stories about that. So we really want to be able to do the job well. And then um, also keep everybody involved. A lot of times, because we're having meetings for these um, planning things, there, there are some stakeholders holders that will show up and others that won't, and then you miss, you miss key information mm -hmm. and key buy-in from, from those folks. So you've got to keep people involved, so it's how to schedule the meetings also. And then one other thing that I've learned is if you have any questions at all, ask them, ask the, bring them up the flagpole, and don't be afraid to make a mock-up of the space mm -hmm. because sometimes you can't. It, it looks really good on paper, but then when you get in there, it's really too tight of a space. And every time we've done another floor on the a procedural space on the Gonda building, the pre post rooms are getting bigger and bigger. We thought we had them right the first mm -hmm. time on, on 7, and then we changed it to 2. We made them a little bit bigger. And 15, they're bigger and bigger yet, and they're still not big enough. So mm -hmm. Interesting. maybe we'll get them right in these, uh, these next two that we do up. Great. So what suggestions might you have for those who are in the early stages of their own facilities oversight committee? I think that um, structuring it the way we have, where you have a, a role ordered um, structure is very helpful. And so that way you have input from all the major kind of stakeholders and everybody it provides transparency too. So I look at our committee system as being one that not only makes decisions but also disseminates information. So you want to be able to have the right people at the table so that when somebody questions a decision, it's easy to say, well, so and so was there, or this was this was a, a you know a group decision. It was not just made by a couple of people in in a back room somewhere. Okay. So do that. And then the other thing is, and I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier when you're talking about the Enterprise and the Midwest Facilities Committee, but our Mayo Rochester committee structure is probably slow and and it, I know it appears really onerous to the folks in the health system, but but theirs was doing things very fast too. I mean, mm -hmm. to the extent that I can tell you a story where once the MRI appeared and they hadn't figured out that the structure would not be able to hold it, oh. so they had to send it back. So if we could somehow balance the speed and okay. the flexibility, you want to have enough, enough checks and balances, but you don't want to have too many. Mm. So what do you think is going to be your biggest challenge, your male's biggest challenge coming up in the next five to ten years? It's going to balance the unending appetite for capital between all of the sites because if you look at what's on our major capital list for facilities projects in rochester in the health system in arizona and florida they are all very worthy projects and so how we decide we're going to distribute that is going to be the really tough one i mean it's it's a great problem to have because it shows you how successful we are but it's going to be it's it's going to be a tough one Good. Well, Mail Clinic really appreciates your leadership. Well, thank the, you. So it's a, not an easy job, and you have done a wonderful thank job, you. and hopefully they keep you for many more years in your position. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I drive a 92 Red Saab, and I do check under it before I get in every evening. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> great. All right. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Horlocker. Now I'd like to turn to Danielle Crawley, who's worked on a interesting project, the Complex Interventional Unit. So why don't you go ahead and talk about your project? Sure. Thanks, Tony. And I appreciate your um, comments about mocking up a room. We actually did mock up some of the complex intervention stuff because it was definitely on our on our thought process of what do we do and how do we do this right the first time rather than coming back and doing it again. So I would love to share some information about the complex intervention unit. It was a great partnership with facilities and the practice and developing this unit to keep our staff and our patients safe. 
Um, when I first began working on the complex intervention unit project, I was seriously shocked about all of the stories of staff being hit or bit by patients and weapons being made out of everyday hospital stuff like MSS basins and walkers, them being thrown across the hallways or hitting um, other staff. I was even more shocked when I found out how often these events were occurring and how staff just considered it part of their job. Our staff just wanted to do the best thing for our patients. I really do think that. And and I don't think that they were really worrying about their own safety at the same time. They just wanted to do the right thing. It wasn't until we just continued to see an increase in violent patient incidents that a more focused effort really came about to initiate um, a better way to care for these patients and to keep our patients, our staff, and others um, safe. Interestingly, according to Occupational Safety and Health Act, um, OSHA, between 2011 and 2013, the United States averaged about 24,000 workplace assaults annually, with 70 to 74 percent of those occurring in healthcare and social services settings. This was very shocking to me. Uh, OSHA and the Joint Commission are definitely on our side to support and enforce safe initiatives to decrease work violence. OSHA describes workplace violence as an act or threat of physical violence, harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behavior that occurs at the work site. It is an OSHA requirement to have guidelines in place to prevent workplace violence. In addition, the Joint Commission actually just released this year an alert stating that disruptive behavior can result in medical errors, decrease patient satisfaction, and increase adverse outcomes, and also increase in cost and turnover of healthcare staff. We were already kind of seeing some of this to ha um, beginning to happen in our own hospital settings, as more staff were requiring time off or restricted work hours due to violent patient incidents or the need for additional staffing and security to provide safe care to disruptive patients and to keep others safe. We were also taking up extra rooms. Um, you'd hate to hear this from a, from a space perspective, but we were taking up extra rooms to provide buffers around the disruptive patients in hopes to not impact other patients and their satisfaction with our care here. Mayo Clinic leadership recognized the need to address some of these workplace violence issues to meet those OSHA requirements, as, as well as to prepare us for some of that joint commission standardization that we may see in the future. And it's really the right thing to do for our patients um, overall, um, all of our patients. We don't want to treat the violent and disruptive patients differently than the rest of our patients. Um, so back in the spring of 2015, a team was pulled together to start discussions on how to decrease staff injuries due to aggressive patients, not really realizing the complexity around this issue and the growing violent patient population in our hospitals. In the spring of 2016, it was determined a designated space and a comprehensive plan was needed to manage the volume of aggressive patients in the hospital. This was when the hospital tapped management engineering and consulting to assist a multidisciplinary team to develop the complex intervention unit. This is also when I think the space team got tapped to, to help us out and, and start looking at space throughout the entire hospital. Um, MENC's role was very critical in this project, as you can only imagine. And as the health systems engineer that was assigned to this, pro this project, I really helped with some of the facilities optimization by collecting data from various sources to identify the potential patient population. At the time of this project, we really didn't have a way to collect who, who are our violent patients. There was no attribute that really identified violent patients in our hospital. This data was used to determine adequate space within our existing footprint of the hospital, which was very shocking because we don't have a lot of space in our hospital. Um, once we got approval from the space committee, um, things got real. We moved very, very, very quick. Um, we started planning the facilities as well as developing an operational plan for how this unit would function. We had a lot of planning to do to prepare for the opening date of this unit, which was just shortly after, um, or I guess within a year of doing getting approval. Um, we also had to create an interim plan to manage these patients um, in the interim. There was obviously a growing need for management of the violent patients and we had to take action very quickly. We spent many hours designing the space with facilities and the practice team. We wanted to ensure that the space was meeting the needs of this new level of care that was being defined at the same time. We, we created a whole new um, way to care for these patients very differently. Uh, the new care model was unique 
to having a co-primary service with the hospital internal medicine and psychiatry, caring for these patients collaboratively, treating their medical or surgical needs, um, at the same time as addressing their psychiatric or behavioral health needs. Very um, different approach with those patients. Um, and since the practice was wanting to manage these patients differently, we definitely identified some policies and protocols that needed to be that needed to be developed and or refined to care for these patients and to kind of keep us all in line. And we also put them through um, live simulations to test them out and ensure that they were very functional and operational with all of the different people on the unit prior to the unit opening. Uh, at the same time, we were also working with the practice team to determine admission criteria for this unit. As I said, we were developing a unit to provide a safe environment for violent or aggressive patients. And to claim that a patient is violent or aggressive is something that's very subjective. Uh, we don't, some of us have different thresholds of what a violent patient may look like. We have um, different thresholds on what we have experienced personally in our work experience and considering what is just part of our job. Everyone has a different perception of what that looks like. And so we had to kind of take past experiences and different ideas and put them through some triage simulations to really define what was our admission criteria for these for these patients as they were coming up onto the unit. Because we figured that there would be a large influx of people wanting to transfer patients into this unit, we weren't quite sure how that, that was going to go. Um, so then we worked um, hand in hand in this team as they went live. We really identified some of the right metrics to measure their performance and how they were going to um, show how they were doing to the institution and how they were doing to upper leadership as the success of this, of this um, project. My role was quite extensive in this project um, through, from the very beginning to the very end. I think I just came off of it recently and we still have lots of work that continues to be done. Um, but I'd love to show you in the next slides exactly what we did. Um, so on the left here, as I mentioned, we had an interim way to manage these patients uh, before the complex intervention unit was completed. We very quickly put together a plan to modify eight rooms on two different units. And the picture on the left where it says co-location, this was the end of the hallways of one of the two units that we used. Um, this was a quick fix that happened almost overnight when we were at a max threshold of spreading staff all over the two hospitals, two campuses to care for these patients. We would have security guards all over our entire campus from um, a few down in the emergency department watching patients to I think at one time we had 15 security guards um, scattered throughout the entire hospital in Rochester um, to watch over these patients. That is in addition to the one-to-one -one nursing requirements that were needed for these patients. Um, so a, a major inefficient use of our resources um, before we kind of developed this new co-location plan. With co-location, we um, had some quick modifications that were used uh, in these general care rooms. Some of those modifications are considered um, by nursing. They can say if the patient needs certain modifications or not, but one of the things that we always um, considered was locking the bathroom door and closets, placing plexiglass on the windows to ensure that they don't break or they're not, um, patients aren't throwing or hitting the glass and creating weapons or jumping out of the windows. Um, and removing the window treatments and cords. And of course, there was a lot of other modifications that were considered for these. Uh, the co-location area was also really great for us to learn and to kind of pilot some of the methodologies that we applied for the complex intervention unit. It also helped us orientate new employees for the complex, the complex intervention unit before opening um, and really introducing staff to this patient population. The picture on the right now is the complex intervention unit. It's, um, I mean, obviously new, so it looks nice and clean and very bright, but it is very warming. It's not the most sterile looking environment. It is secure um, with video surveillance that is monitored 100% by a dedicated security officer. 
and it is designed with psychiatric specifications to ensure minimal ligature risk and other safety mechanisms to protect the patient from harming themselves or others. So the entire unit has caulk around the around the windows. It has caulk around anything that a patient may, able, may be able to hang themselves with, break something off and create a weapon, whatever it might be. Um, in this picture, you'll see the nursing unit is tucked away there. It is a secure nursing unit, which was something that was really um, attractive when we were uh, recruiting nursing because they knew that they would be safe and and if there was something going on in the unit they were able to have a safe place to be um, this the design overall for this unit has proven to be very um, effective in managing these patients oftentimes security has been able to intervene um, when they see a patient starting to escalate or coming at a nurse or whatever it might be, security's been able to quickly um, get to that that instant and um, de-escalate the, inc the incident very quickly. The rooms altogether are designed to take care of a range of medical and surgical patients to include bariatric and dialysis patients and also patients who may need cardiac monitoring through our oversight cardiac monitoring system. Uh, we also created a new locked cabinet. Here's where the mock-up kind of really came in to be was how does this cabinet fit into our patient room and how does it function and creating new workflows on how to use this cabinet because usually when you go into a patient room and there's garbages where you can just throw away um, patient, uh, patient stuff um, without contaminating everything around it. So we had to really identify how are we going to use this cabinet to be able to get into the garbage and not contaminate everything around the cabinet in, the, in that same workflow. Um, there are other, other, um, other intricate details obviously with the entire room itself that make it very unique compared to other hospital general care rooms that really help to ensure the safety of these patients and our staff. Um, let's see here with the outcomes there were so many great outcomes from this project I can't even tell you I mean th working with this team was amazing it was such a an amazing engagement with facilities and planning the entire facility uh, bringing all of these people together I mean we had people from psychiatry hospital internal medicine nursing facilities security operations everybody was involved in this multidisciplinary team as we were planning for this unit and you would think that people would come together with their own agendas and and like you said like they would come there thinking oh i need this because it's for my practice no everyone came together and they really advanced towards an objective to provide a safer option to care for these difficult patients in our hospital and people really recognize the need for a unit like this or a place where we can care for these patients more effectively we were able to design this unit to meet our ask to ensure safety for the patients and staff just despite some of the constraints of working in an old existing unit with a strict budget. Um, we were definitely under a, a big budget crunch with this unit. Uh, and we definitely had to go through like what were our, our must haves and what were our want to haves compared to um, so that we were living within our budget and within the facility that we were given. The complex intervention unit has, successful, has successfully been open for almost a year and we have received patients from all over the hospital, from dementia patients receiving care in oncology to patients in general care who are recovering from drug withdrawal. Also having this unit has improved the throughput of the emergency department, allowing them to move patients more quickly through the emergency department instead of them waiting for other units to prepare to receive these, these destructive patients. Um, overall, the hospital has seen a significant decrease in staff injuries due to aggressive patients, which has also decreased the amount of security and be behavioral emergency response team calls throughout the entire hospital, which is amazing because we have staff that are trained and and willing to work with these with these patients. Um, one of the things when we were going through the process, it was we were really shocked at how many people volunteered to work on this unit. Nobody was forced to apply to work on this unit. They really wanted to work on this unit. And that is the difference, I think, that what makes this unit very successful is we have staff who 
are engaged and empowered to work on this unit and they are trained with all of I mean with de-escalation techniques they, they have additional things in their toolbox like the restraint chair and emergency medication kits and different ways to work with these patients and it really has proven to be very successful overall so it's been a joy to work with this team and I, I'd be open to any questions and if we have any questions um, from the viewers that would be great great I appreciate that yeah. you work on that it's a, such a you know complex uh, problem I think across the nation and the world with the violent patients so uh, you've done a great job and I think a lot of other healthcare institutions can learn from what Mayo Clinic yeah. did so absolutely hopefully we can spread the word and Mayo learned from other institutions too this was one this was a completely new service line because as Daniel was saying we didn't do this before it was all patchwork and so they went and benchmarked and went to see how other groups did it and saw should this be an open versus a closed not, not meaning locked but as in should who should have admitting privileges there because you don't want to expose all physicians and all staff to this if they still have to go and you want to have the professionals that know how to mm -hmm. de-escalate so yeah. yeah but we learned a lot from other folks too yeah it was actually really interesting when we were doing the benchmarking because we have a very unique population here and I think um, when we went out and benchmarked, we recognize how acute some of our patients are here in Rochester and how this unit had to be slightly different than the areas that we benchmarked with. And we were very appreciative of the other large academic centers that we benchmarked um, against. And we definitely took back some of those learnings and applied them here. And I think that was the hardest thing when we came to the space committee was well, I don't really, we don't really know what we're doing, but we know it's a good thing to do. It's a better way to take care of these patients. And so it was just like in good faith, we were like, just just help us out. <laughs> yeah. And so now we see yeah. how, what a great success it's been. Yeah, great. No, a lot of great outcomes. It's just incredible. And I just want to say for the record, her, her strict budget was less than $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> And the reason we say that is otherwise <laughs> I have to go on the major capital list, which means it's got to go all the way up the flagpole for mm. approval. And we knew we needed to get this done soon. So that was yes. a strict budget. <laughs> yes, great. yes. And we got it done quickly with the yeah. help of yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. And I think leadership, all the upper leadership was amazing in supporting yeah. this this project well great good yeah. well it looks like we got some questions from our viewers um, the first one is uh, I'll let dr. Horlocker answer this one do you have any advice for similar committees and smaller hospitals say community-based hospitals where the budget is much smaller and how can these smaller facilities find the right expertise to help them strategically plan for their future in regards to facilities that, that's a really good question I think there, there are two issues. One is also in the smaller hospitals, trying to get physician involvement is more difficult because if you're not seeing patients, you're not generating revenue. Mm -hmm. So the meetings have to be early in the morning or, or late in the afternoon. So that's difficult. And th that's the expertise you really, you really need. You want to have the, the folks that are with the patients making those decisions. I would, I would give the advice, just as Danielle was saying, you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Call, call your, your friends in other places. Um, we, I've done a lot of regional anesthesia pathways and, and then we um, are a bit involved in those. Those then get published and then everybody can follow how, how Mayo Clinic does it. Mm -hmm. So again, um, feel free to, I mean, I'm happy to take any physician-based questions. Um, I'm sure that Danielle and, and you know, Emmy and C will, will do that. Our facilities engineers get questions all the time mm -hmm. and, and they ask questions all the time too. So it's kind of ex extend the, your hand out and ask for it. Yeah, great. Okay, good. Uh, the next one is how does the committee know it's been successful do you go back and measure the proponent's satisfaction with the project and how about patient satisfaction with the new or remodeled facilities that's another really good question because the timeline from when we actually approve them to when they're completed is sometimes so far out that we don't we don't even remember when it's done but there are some that we do go back and collect, especially utilization data, if we have a question of, was this right sized or not? Mm -hmm. Or they say, you know, we think we're gonna need six more exams right away. It's like, well, you're gonna have to prove that to me. So we do look at that, um, especially, for example, with um, the Gonda um, Cancer Center remodel, we really wanted to see if that was gonna be helpful and when they were gonna run out of space again in the, in the chemo center. So we've been following um, those numbers um, patient satisfaction is really easy to tell because people mm -hmm. write letters in and you know you know when you when you have a bad situation when you get 
letters and you know when you have a good situation because you get letters so those two things are pretty easy right. and the staff satisfaction again we don't go back and formally measure that very often because mm -hmm. it, it is relatively subjective especially if somebody next to you gets new space and you're still in your old space you, you're gonna you're gonna not like that mm -hmm. so there's a lot of human nature involved okay. too but that's right. a good question and we probably should follow up more but MENC has only so many resources <laughs> and we can't tap them for everything and we want to do more master planning mm -hmm. so that we can get these projections done you know earlier in advance and so we just can't do as much as we'd really like to okay yeah. great um, if it's uh, another one for dr. Horlocker can you share any lessons learned from a facilities project that did not go as well as expected <laughs> over budget behind schedule mistakes made in the design <laughs> and construction etc and can you share some general lessons learned without having to get too specific? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course I could, but then you'd have to kill me. Um, so actually, I'll, I'll give you one of my favorite ones. And this, this is where I first developed the, if you do something too fast, um, it could go over budget or, or, or wrongly. We created one of our, our outpatient clinics in Rochester several years ago. And we wanted to get it up and running within a year, which is a pretty tight time frame. And... When the proponents moved in, it's an outpatient clinic, so I don't know, family med, internal medicine, that mm -hmm. those kind of things. I think there's a lab out there and all that. When the proponents moved in, they found out that when they're trying to install the, the bench, the you know couch that the patients sit on, that because they'd never done a mock-up and the, the scales were already installed, the bench was going to be in front of the scale, so you'd never be able to. So we had to go and take all of those those couches and cut them off by a couple feet. In, in every exam room and they, they brought that back and and I said I'm sorry I, I'm an oldest kid I just got to ask the question how did this happen the answer was the people that designed it are not the ones that work there okay. so it's I mean it seems like okay mm -hmm. so have the people with the skin in the game be mm -hmm. involved but that's okay. that's probably my my favorite one well, cut yeah all the couches down yeah Amazing. yeah exactly and likewise um, th there's a Poor Brad Lahr, I hope he's not watching this, because he's, he's going to hate elevators for the rest of his life. Uh, we, we are doing that expansion of our, our bed tower there, and now to Brad's true defense, we had never planned on putting an OR up on that third floor. That was going to be um, something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now when it decided to be, or cardiac OR, it was going to be PEDS or something else. When we decided to put cardiac over there, all of a sudden somebody said you know the cardiac patients these days have all this extra um, ventilators and and um, ventricular assist devices and they have three or four people going with them and we should see if they can fit into the elevator oh. and the stuff didn't fit <laughs> oh really so instead um, we had to take the elevator bank and make one big one instead of two which costs money now again you say how did this happen because in our other bed tower, it's okay, well, that's a custom-made one to be that big. Mm -hmm. And when we built the second bed tower, we said, we're just going to have the largest standard size one. So again, this is one of those things that you figure other people are having the same problem mm -hmm. because we're not the only ones that have LVAD patients and ventilators and all that. But again, without having that mock-up ahead of time, yeah. you know, that was that was just another... Interesting. Yeah. And I think that's the importance. One of the tools we use in MENC is simulation modeling. Yeah. So we've been able to simulate uh, the proton beam facility and other things. So yeah, that kind of that study before yeah. you start building yeah. is very important. And again, you know, who would have thought that that wasn't going to work? Yeah. And there's a lot of things that were unforeseen, but that was a big one. So you can't say the word elevator to Brad anymore. Okay, I'll remember that. <laughs> yeah, he starts shaking. <laughs> <laughs> this is a question for Danielle. Can you share any patient stories or comments from patient family caregivers that show the value to, of the unit? Oh, absolutely. We and this is actually a really interesting topic because we've had patients that have been on this unit who have written letters back to the the unit providers and the um, patient experience office saying how appreciative they are of the space and how responsive the staff were to their specific needs. Um, whether if it was their psychiatric need of schizophrenia while they were getting care for their diabetes. Um, the patient just in, in the past had didn't feel like they were being heard and they were kind of being ignored because they were seen as someone different. And mm -hmm. so on this unit, the staff are really able to respond um, differently to the patient and really and really show them the compassion and show them care. Not that we don't give this on our on our everyday other units, but 
um, the staff on this unit are definitely trained to be able to manage this, the care of these patients differently. The visitors and the family that come up there love it because they have their own space to visit with these patients. And that was one of the things that we built into the unit was to have um, a specific visitor space for those patients. So children and um, other visitors are not coming on the unit and having to cross paths with other patients potentially. Mm. So it's been very successful and we've heard lots of great stories from staff and or from the patients and their family members. Great. Looks like we have a question for Danielle and Dr. Horlocker. How do you practice Mayo Clinic values for compassion, respect for patients, and the need to protect staff, family members, etc.? Must be a tough balance. Well, actually, I, I'll echo what Danielle had said earlier. When, when I was involved with this space and remodeling chair, I was thinking they're never going to find anybody that wants to work there. But there are very special providers that do want to care for these patients because they understand they have a special need. And, and likewise, all of the provider staff, you know, allied health, nursing, physicians and all, the way the previous system was, any patient could be violent and you were supposed to have these skills to deal with that and you, and you didn't know who, who it was going to be. And, and even if you did know, you didn't have all the skills or you didn't know how to use them. I mean, there was a, a resident, they knew they had a violent patient and she went into the room and she had her stethoscope around her neck as we usually do and the patient grabbed him and started choking her and it had the the metal end not come off he may have succeeded but so now by by placing these patients in this unit and having these these gifted staff mm -hmm. care for them um, it's it's a much better world for everybody and there hasn't been trouble staffing it and so mm -hmm. the staff mm -hmm. staff satisfaction has gone up everywhere yeah, and I think one of the biggest things too, when we consider um, compassion in our in our patients, if we have staff that are engaged, if we have mm -hmm. staff that are empowered, and they enjoy what they're doing, they're going to provide more compassion. They're going to be more um, caring in the roles that they're providing. And so, having staff that are able to care for these patients, I think, is is really addressing the compassion, even while addressing the mm -hmm. safety of them being in their role and everyone else in the hospital including the patient the patients themselves as well as the visitors mm -hmm. the, the other thing was that some of the patients on that unit were in the ed as you alluded to and so they were not medically admitted patients yet as as most of these are but they so these were patients that were just plain violent and there was no place to put them because they didn't need a hospitalization and they needed psych care and there was no, I mean, you know, Minnesota has so few psych beds. So there was no place to put them. So they'd keep them in these terrible rooms in the emergency department. And because they had to be safe rooms for all the reasons that you spoke, I mean, no windows, <laughs> nothing in them. Um, you know, if you're sitting in there days and sometimes weeks at a time, you can imagine how those patients felt in, in that situation, too. So, again, having this unit for them. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Yeah. So a question for Dr. Horlocker. Do you have a structured approach to accepting facility projects? What are the key items you look for before undertaking one of them? Well, again, I have to stress to the highest level that the practice drives facilities. And so we come up with a list and we can decide um, where to put the new bed tower because we do the analysis of the ground and we know how, how many rooms to put in because of bed projections. But we really need the practice to tell us yeah, we need it, and this is our prioritization. So the structured approach is we really listen to the practice, and then these are major capital projects now that, that I'm talking about. I will present those um, with Doug Holton, who's our you know head of facilities, to the Midwest Executive Operation um, Group. And then that way, you know, we say, here's what we kind of are seeing, but you guys know the practice, and you know Mayo Clinic strategic goals. How, how do you want to prioritize them? Mm -hmm. And, and we, base, we base them on kind of the things I was saying before uh, about how do they um, align with those strategic goals, the needs of the patient come mm -hmm. first, what's the cost benefit, benefit th those other things. We don't actually have a point system, if, okay. if that's what the questioner is, is asking. Um, but you just kind of have a feeling of how these things are going to rank okay. based on need. Great. Question for Danielle. How do you recruit staff to work on the unit? It must be hard. We thought for sure we would have a very difficult time recruiting staff for this unit. It was amazing um, how many people applied to be on this unit and how much people, the people who work on there just enjoy working on there. 
I would, I'd like to say um, s some of it is due to amazing leadership, I think, with this unit. The, the nurse manager and the medical director are very compassionate and very empowering to the staff, and I think that was a main driver for a lot of our internal staff that came onto this unit. We also had um, some very interesting appl applicants that came through um, from like the medical, the federal medical center or um, some sheriffs who had been sheriffs in other places or who have a law enforcement background and other, I mean, other places that you would never think that they would come here and want to work with the, on this unit. And so it was really amazing. And so far, knock on wood, we haven't had anybody want to leave okay. or, or change positions. They've really enjoyed working on the unit. Good. Even after some of them have been injured, mm -hmm. they're like, bring me back to work. I'm ready to go. So, All right. Well, it looks like yeah. we're running out of time here. Um, so I want to thank our guest speakers and everyone for attending our management engineering and consulting webinar. Please feel free to contact us by calling us at 507-284-3424 or visiting our website at menc.mayoclinic.org if you have any questions about our external consulting services. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thanks, Tony. Thank you.